We have about 25 minutes left. Why don't I start with folks in the room? Does anybody have a question for a panelist? Mary? Um, yeah, this has could, been so. Can you identify yourself? Thank you. Mary Woolley, Research America. Uh, there's so much of a, such a rich conversation, it's sort of hard to choose, you know, what one question can I ask first, you know, or engage. But I, I would like to, I just can't help but, but reflect on something you said very recently, Alan, about the, um, the dire financial situation, if I heard you correctly, that the United States is facing and how we have to get past that before we can do a lot of other things. Um, and I would posit that there's a very strong argument that um, a more robust science enterprise in this country would, in fact, actually contribute in a big way to improving the financial situation. And there's a history to support that, as well as other nations right now um, taking a page from what we might call the U.S. playbook to ramp up their own federal support as well as federal policy support uh, for the private sector to really drive the science enterprise so that it can contribute to the economy as well as to the health and, and individual prosperity of the citizenry. So I, I, I really wonder whether that conversation is ongoing um, uh, with your uh, committee and if it's not, if there's an opportunity to have it. Uh, the conversation is, is ongoing. Uh, uh, we have members who are thinking about <clears throat> that very question. And, and I think that's the reason we still have to do a lot more oversight about uh, tr trying to find out what's working and what, uh, what doesn't work. You know, I mentioned um, about the trend of the NIH budget basically being stabilized after uh, a spurt where uh, in a brief period of time they had their the budget doubled. Uh, and then there was a brief period of time where the NIH was able to get some stimulus money. So where they said, uh, they made the kind of, I think, I sense it's the same kind of argument, which is, gee, give us some stimulus money here at NIH and we're going to produce jobs. So. Uh, I don't know what the, you know, it's been a couple of years since the end of that stimulus spending. I think that's a question we'll want to take a look at to see uh, that how many jobs did it produce. If, I mean, that wasn't the only argument for it, but certainly that was the way they were trying to sell it. So I think one of the ways they're trying to sell it. So, yeah, we ought to take a look at that. Um, but, I mean, the. The re it, this is, I'm just an oversight. I'm just an investigator. I'm not the policy guy. I'm not the budget guy. So I don't pretend to be an expert on it. But you know, my sense right now is um, uh, we have a long ways to go uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, get things straightened out on, on, uh, on in terms of the budget, in terms of trying to. Uh, you know, uh, get that budget deficit reduced. Uh, you know, we got so much uh, debt already accumulated. Uh, I'm going to jump in because as an outside you know, observer, an independent observer, I would say for those of out, out in the world who don't spend a lot of time in Washington, this is a, a rather nuanced example of the seed corn debate, which is even in times of economic hardship, should the nation be investing a lot in R&D because it is central to job creation and, and keeping the United States competitive. Mary, I didn't actually hear a question. I heard a question, but I'm curious, did you have another question that was more focused yeah. on the science communication angle? Yeah, I, I, um Thank you for letting me um, come back in because I do um, hear a, a t uh, theme, but nobody actually has used the word. So this is where the question comes in about the um, necessity, and I think it is a necessity, for accountability, to demonstrate accountability. And this links to what you were just saying, I think, Alan, uh, by the science community for explaining to the American public the value of what they're spending their money on, say, with a federal agency. And that nobody has used that word on this panel that I heard, anyway. 
the accountability function of science communication. So I wonder whether you all agree that there is an accountability function, and if, if so, um, how should that be uh, better instituted? And if you don't, I'd, I'd like to understand why not. Before the panelist addresses that, first of all, Kai, I believe you have a comment you wanted to jump in with? Thanks, David. Uh, uh, um, I guess I, I had a comment in an earlier part of the conversation, but let me uh, come back to what Mary's saying, because I think that, again, in the environmental arena, um, I think accountability is, is critical because we're dealing with um, uh, public goods uh, in, in the environmental sphere. Uh, and the function of science communications, um, it seems to me, is, is not accountability itself, but to provide the, the ingredients for an accountability discussion. Um, uh, and, and that's what we've been trying to do uh, with organizations like Compass or uh, the Aldo Leopold program, uh, is to advance that, is, is to create that, uh, to, to create those uh, ingredients. Now, you might be asking Mary a question about the accountability of science communications itself. Uh, that's a different conversation, and I just want to acknowledge that I'm, I'm answering only part of your question. I, I don't think she is. I think she's addressing this issue of whether the community, scientific community writ large has a, an obligation to be accountable to, to at least uh, those who are taxpayer funded. Yes, and, but I would also say that science communication, like all um, activities, uh, whether they're funded by the federal government or anybody else, should be evaluated and should be accountable. I think we all agree about that. I think, well, I will say that, you know, my, I did not use some of the words for deliberately uh, because I think we lose the opportunity of this conversation if we focus it on, on you know, a, frankly, a self-interested uh, uh, way to that if we increase scientific communication, then public support f financially for science will be increased. If, if that is what the conversation is about, I think we lose an opportunity. I think we also lose an opportunity if we uh, uh, talk about science communication as this instrumental tool for, you know, showing accountability. No, I mean, it, I think scientific communication is an intrinsic part of the scientific enterprise. And just to go back to the sports metaphor, you know, if a football game is played and no one sees it, then what value is it? <laughs> Same with you know, scientific research. I mean, if an experiment takes place in a lab and no one knows about it, then what was the value of that? So I think scientific communication is an integral part of it. And so going back to what I said earlier, um, you know, my opinion is that it, it's it's proper for scientific communication to be integrated with federal research investments. It is a part of, you know, what the federal government supports in research. Uh, and, there are, and we have some, you know, good models. There are experimentation. Various agencies do it in different ways, and they've evolved over time. For example, uh, in day one, I think we heard from Sunny Ramaswamy about the agriculture extension model, in which for that community, uh, the communication of agricultural science, those life sciences, to uh, define defined community of farmers has evolved over time to be a very effective ways of, of a communication. Um, NSF is trying some different approaches because th that audience is actually all of us. Uh, NSF, we are, we are, as a community, are communicating not only to us as a science community, but all of us as citizens. So there are different models being tried, and I think that's appropriate, because if we are going to maximize the impact of our research efforts, we need to be able to uh, communicate the results to people who either need to know or maybe we think they ought to know. So taking the journalist prerogative to put words in people's mouth, I believe we heard a plea from Kai for a complete publication of all negative results. <laughs> and I think we heard a plea from Mary that NIH should adopt the NSF standard of having every grantee be required to have a public engagement. <laughs> I, no, you didn't hear me say that. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't hear me say that uh, either, David. But, uh, I, I think that one of the things that that is worth paying attention to is uh, John Burris's historical perspective. And over time, uh, what science has done is to change our understanding of how the world works and of the place of humans within it. 
uh, and that means that you know the lectures, the Faraday lectures of the early 19th century, uh, focused on on discoveries, you know, sort of basic discoveries that might be of interest to the broader um, to, to the broad public, and that still happens. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope, I think, has been a, a great exemplar of, of how the, the appeal of uh, fundamental exploration and discovery. But a great deal more of what science has done in the past, um, uh, in the post-war period, in the past 75 years, uh, is really to, to, to shed light uh, to, to, on areas that are not of broad public interest. Uh, necessarily, but are of great uh, either instrumental interest, um, as in the you know what Mary was talking about about economic productivity, uh, or else in terms of uh, understanding the dimensions of policy uh, and 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 what what constitutes a proper decision. Uh, and I think things like the environmental impact statement, uh, uh, are, you know, are an example uh, is an example of that. And the communications challenge is different, it seems to me, uh, for a museum appealing to the general public or a STEM curriculum that's trying to create a, a kind of basic literacy uh, as for as contrasted to the communications challenges um, of informing the, the right audience, like farmers that Kay uh, was just talking about, about new seed varieties or new uh, cultivation methods and so on. So, so there's a lot of different aspects of science communications uh, that are here, uh, they're operating now in parallel, uh, and it's it's it makes sense not to confuse them under some uh, a broad rubric. And in particular, again, coming back to what Bruce and Rick said at the beginning, uh, the 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 deficit model of you know we'll put the information out there and the public will then make use of it. Uh, we're, I think we're still struggling with how to go beyond the deficit model of how to find users. Uh, understand what is useful to them, uh, and then engage them in what is becoming a dialogue between the user and the research community, uh, so that there's better coupling. And you see that, you know, in biomedicine and things like ACT UP and the AIDS activists, uh, you know, demanding uh, that research change direction uh, across the board. So, th so there's a lot of different things going on out there, uh, and I think we are struggling with the basic model of what it is we're trying to do in science communication still. Yeah, okay, I, we, I think John wants to wait in, Dennis, Rick, and then I saw a couple of other hands. So John? L let me pick up on what Kai said because I agree very much with what he said in that we have very different audiences. You, David, said a few minutes ago, if we explain to people what we do, then they will support us. And I think that that's a naive model that doesn't work. We have various forms of communication. That is a legitimate form of communication. It's a wonderful form of science communication. And I encourage everyone to do that, to explain to people what they're doing and try to get them excited about the science, et cetera. And then maybe down the line it will somehow translate into support. But I think the second part, uh, the one that, that I think Mary does effectively and others, is that it's a very directed communication at an audience with a goal that ultimately it's not just to uh, educate them, it's to inform them in a fashion that they will then act upon providing more support or in some fashion uh, being of assistance to us. And I think uh, we at, at a foundation oftentimes tend to focus more on the first one. In other words, we want communication through, we want the, the public to be, this famous public, to be better informed. To us, that's a wonderful success story. If kids get turned on to science, if their parents get turned on to science, that's a form of science communication that I think oftentimes museums and zoos and others do very effectively. The second form is, is a much more, is a much different form, and I think in some cases requires even a different um, form of training, so be it, uh, that you're very targeted, it's, you understand your audience, and your goal is to somehow persuade them that what you do has a value that is translated in turn into some financial support. And I think that in science communication, not that the first is not important to the second and the second is not important to the first, but I think that you have to, in one of the earlier slides, talked a lot about audience. 
I think we tend to forget who our audience is, who we're really trying to address. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind. And we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm encouraging everybody to be as succinct as possible. Dennis? Uh, I'll try and do that. I think it's important in, in looking at Mary's question to go back and ask why did the science do communication in the first place? And when you ask them that question, one of the high, uh, the, one of the high reasons is they're excited about conveying what they do. I don't know how much they think about that, and that's going to give me funding, but they think it's very important that the public be ex interested and excited uh, and know about their research. I mean, they also think kids should be excited about science in general. They want to show uh, the enthusiasm they have in general. But it is a major incentive on their part for, for if you want to call that accountability anyway. Rick? So the, the flour and seed companies were very prescient last week in the depths of the cold freeze to deliver all the new catalogs for the spring season to my door the same day that it was minus 17 degrees. And I have only three vegetable boxes in my backyard to grow these things. And I've already ordered more seeds than I can possibly, five, five times more seeds than I can plant there. And I, and I want to get back to something Amanda said, which was, sort of went unnoticed, I think, in the conversation. What about the demand side? Do we have any confidence at all that there is, a, that there is a, a, an audience out there for the kind of stuff that we're talking about today? Do we have the right kind of science communication to reach an audience or to grow that audience? Or the more, is, it, is it a truism that the more science communication we do, the more people will listen? I don't think there's any evidence that suggests that. Uh, who had a hand up? Andy Rosenberg, I believe. Yeah. Um, two comments. The first one, a little bit grouchy, and you can attribute that to my bad back, and the second one, not so grouchy. If the purpose of science communication is to increase support and funding, and I was an appropriator, I wouldn't fund you to do it either. I don't think that's the purpose of science communication, is to increase our funding. If it is, fine. I mean, that's a good thing. We can all be on the marketing side that you described in the opening remarks. I thought, actually, the purpose of life science communication was so that we could actually use those results to better people's lives or public policy, not to fund more science. And those things aren't orthogonal, but um, at least from my bad back perspective and a fair amount of pain, that sort of rankled a little bit. The, perhaps less grouchy comment is that there's one model, sort of goes to what Rick was just saying, that is sustained, funded, um, and very widespread at federal and state level for science communication that I don't think anyone has directly referred to, and that's the extension model. And, um, you know, that's been around for 75 years. Um, and it's not just agricultural extension, of course. There's extension for um, in social sciences, there's certainly extension in marine sciences, there's extension in agriculture and land-based. Um, and it has a lot of um, problems, I would say, and in some ways is an a old model. One of its problems is that uh, if some of you have been, and I've been a, a, um, a university dean um, in a life sciences and agriculture school, um, it's very difficult to get researchers to work directly with extension agents even, and, or to consider them to be scientists, much as it's difficult to get researchers to, to you know, work with people uh, in, in other applications of, of science as opposed to the direct basic research. But there is a model of communication there that isn't media communication nearly so much as it's direct engagement with the public. And so I wonder whether it's worth thinking about that, whether there are some elements of the 75 or however many years of extension work that have been done that should be considered in this idea uh, of infrastructure because um, it has been sustainably funded, even though I'm sure they would argue, just like NIH, that they are underfunded as long as you removed several orders of magnitude in dollars. They, you know, they've had the same kind of... Uh, um, flat or declining funding as, as an organization like NIH has um, through the extension programs. So it, at least consider that as another infrastructure model for funding. Somewhere over fun. here, who, who, who had it? Erica? So I want to um, 
I'm Eric Goldman from Compass. I wanted to address the accountability question a bit. So I heard um, across a couple different um, speakers that we don't really know how much we're spending federally on science communication in a, in a widespread way. And from a an monitoring and evaluation and impact side, we also don't know really what we're getting from the investment. And we also don't know where in existing legislation agencies have mandates already to be doing science communication. So my question is that, is, are filling those knowledge gaps a prerequisite for developing a sustainable infrastructure? Or can we envision a pathway by which the filling of those data gaps and the creation of sustainable infrastructure can happen um, at simultaneously or in a concurrent manner? Sounds like an academy study in the offing. Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> Um, I think uh, I, will, I will tackle that in that I think because of, well, the data situation I've described, a sustainable life sciences communication research infrastructure will have to develop in the absence of, you know, perfect data. So I mean, that's the challenge for us. Um, and I don't know whether we in the room and others are ready to meet that challenge, I don't know. Um, I think to return to, to Rick's point, uh, there are data. I mean, the data are sketchy, but for example, National Science Foundation collects a lot of data on public attitudes toward, toward science. They're all embodied in the science and engineering indicators. So those data suggest to me that there is a base. There's interest. There's interest in engaging, but of course in people's daily lives. Uh, that is not, it's not harnessed as much as, as um, we might be, be able to. So I think that's cause for optimism, that you know, there's a willingness to engage among uh, uh, our fellow citizens. Um, and therefore, it is up to us to, to meet them more than halfway. And then, of course, meet them as partners in, in communication, two-way communication, rather than a, a one-way communication model. So I mean, those are the, the things that came to my mind as we were hearing the, these last few comments. So, so, oh, sorry. So well, we think about this a lot at NSF. So what is it that we need to know and figure out and, and build off of? And I think some of the questions that need to be answered first is, so if you collect this information, at what level do you, what are, what are the tipping points? If I get this information, what's it going to tell me so I can make a decision? And I have to admit, we often find that we, so we don't know what's the, the the metrics, or, and, and, and they could be somewhat, I don't want to say arbitrarily set, but they're very difficult to decide what you think is the right amount or uh, the right infrastructure and so on. So I think at the same time we think about that, but we also know that there are many good examples. So if you know you want to build infrastructure, I'll pick that as the area. We know there's a number of models of infrastructure that's out there, the nanotechnology uh, network. Uh, and, and other network, I won't go into that, but other networks that exist. So then I think it's much more valuable probably to do an analysis of what are those networks and then what does the life science group want to do to build the best infrastructure network around from that. That's probably a better way to, where to, better place to put the efforts in my mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, that's okay. I was going to address the, uh, the accountability issue and the, um, and the, and the data gaps. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a little bit biased because I'm in the oversight business. So, yeah, of course you need the data. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, government is a pretty big place and it's uh, not unusual uh, that you wouldn't know <laughs> in many cases uh, exactly how much the government is spending, say, on, on research and development or on communications. Uh, sometimes in the NIH, uh, there, there is a, a breakout for, uh, uh, for that category, although how it's being defined, I think, is the, uh, the big question. Um, I mean, yeah, you need the data, but I think the, uh, in my personal opinion is, is that the more immediate question are s some of the points I started to hear today, which is, when you're talking about communications, communicating what? If you're communicating science, we're all for that, right? We want to get more scientific information out there for obvious reasons. But if, as uh, uh, one commenter said, if it's about getting more funding, 
well, maybe that's communication the taxpayer shouldn't be spending on, right? Because we want NIH getting information out there to help us get cures, but it's not about having them spend money to uh, get a better image so they can uh, just get more money for the sake of we, we love ourselves and we just want to have a bigger budget. So those are the questions uh, I think uh, I think they are being grappled with or, or uh, NIH is being forced to con confront. We're going to be asking them certainly uh, about uh, you know what what is communicating science and how much of it is really what is public relations. You know I would point out and it's all online. You can take a look at the NIH's response and the individual responses from the institutes. And a number of these institutes have contracts with uh, very well-known public relations firms. Now, again, uh, we always have to learn more about it, but why would, and it's the same firms in many cases, so uh, if, you know, 20 institutes at the NIH all have some kind of contract with this public relations firm, what exactly is that contract for and is there a, you know, is the contractor getting a deal where he's just, uh, the, the firm is just recreating or reselling something they've already done with some of the other institutes? We need to bring some uh, uh, more critical thinking for a lot of different reasons, and not just because of the fiscal situation, but because of the changes that are going on in the media uh, about, uh, at least in the context of the NIH, you know, what exactly, what are, you got to get some definitions. Uh, I think that you've got to get some, some agreement and start building some consensus on what our priorities are on, on when you're talking about science communications. So I just want to add one thing to this um, question of the, the role of funders and science communication and, and what we should be doing here. And, our foundation, when we fund science, we often provide that um, we want our scientists to be engaged. And so we provide that um, funding for and support for training and communications. We work with Compass. Um, you do the same as well um, in, in terms of providing that support for training and um, to help them figure out how to speak, who to speak to, to be connected. And that's part of what we do, that's part of how we think about funding science, is that the communications are integral to that, uh, because we are issue driven, I think. Um, and, uh, but foundations, as, as, as Kai alluded to, we're, we're a drop in the bucket in terms of R&D funding. Um, and so when you look at, at uh, NSF, for example, they rolled out the broader impacts criteria, but without the... Um, infrastructure, the networks, to help scientists figure out how they were going to maximize their broader impacts. And, uh, you know, and I, and they, they, they seem to have learned something from there because they spent all this money building data sharing websites and infrastructure before they rolled out the requirement that every researcher have a data management plan. And so, to my mind, the broader impacts criteria rollout was sort of like, we're asking you to do data sharing before we've built the website to put your data on. Um, and so is there a way, uh, you know, recognizing that, that foundations and philanthropy, we're going to be always small potatoes in this field, it, is there a way that we can work with the big funding agencies, NIH, NSF, to um, be really strategic about building that infrastructure uh, so that we can train scientists uh, Maximize their Sound like there, there are some PR firms that have excellent experience with NIH. Maybe they could yeah, be tapped. <laughs> it's not about PR. Yes. Any other comments from the panel on this? Uh, any other questions? Ida Chow with the Society for Developmental Biology. I just have a comment here, and I think that NAS has uh, talked about this many times. It's not so much of communicating facts even though putting in the proper frames. I think what our obligation is really to help the public to understand how the scientific process takes place. So instead of just saying NIH did this, 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 this to cure 
such disease, we also need to, exp need to explain to the public how the results came about. Because otherwise, the public will, only th will always think and relate numbers, facts with science rather than the whole process. And I think we really, if we want to educate anybody, we need to educate our own scientists and ourselves in how to include this little observation so that we'll have a really much more educated and science um, knowledgeable public then most of these problems may go away. Any other any lost thoughts from the panel? Oh, oh okay. Andy? Just uh, that last comment I certainly agree with, but to the point about the role of foundations, um, I do think that there are things that foundations can do that government agencies can never do. And um, part of that, to use an example from my own program, is that um, foundations and non-governmental organizations do play a really important role on pushing back against miscommunication or misinformation in science, um, which is harder sometimes for government agencies to do in an uh, effective way. And we should remember that there's lots of so-called science communication going on or people presenting what are supposed to be scientific information that really isn't. And that goes to the importance of the process, which is why I brought that up. So I, I, it is useful to think about the, that distinct role um, for philanthropy, um, not just pushing back on miscommunication, but the things that it, it is very difficult for government agencies to do, um, certainly in a, in a um, consistent fashion. Thank you. And, and the corollary that comes to mind for that, of course, is the government agencies are put in positions that no NGO or private firm would often be put in, for example, communicating about things like bird flu, you know, very high stakes uh, issues where good science is critical to getting the public to respond in a, in a constructive way. Uh, any last thoughts from the panel? Well, I'd like to thank everyone for a really interesting conversation that I think did touch on many of the facets of a very difficult issue. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Brooke. Okay. Thanks, David. Thanks to all of you. We have a lot of time now this afternoon to talk more about what we just brought up and to connect it back to other things we've been discussing this morning and the last time we were together. So I know that many of you are anxious to dig in more, and that's what we're going to be able to do um, after a 15-minute break. And when we return, we're really going to get into discussion and do an exercise together to kind of think about how to push this idea forward. And for those of you viewing online, we really want to involve you in this exercise. So please do come back if you're at your computers at home um, in 15 minutes. And for folks here, let's regroup in 15 minutes. So take a break. And we'll dive into some thinking and discussing together. Thanks. Thank you, David.